Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Planning Commission podcast. Today's episode, Walk This Way. You liked that, didn't you? With our <laughs> special guest, Mike McGann, Executive Director of America Walks. Commission podcast is a spirited discussion with myself and a couple of my longtime colleagues in the profession. Our discussions are based solely on our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions or views of our employers, the American Planning Association, or even our alma maters. So grab a seat in the back of City Hall, dig out an old copy of Robert's Rules, and for goodness sakes, read your packet. The Planning Commission is now in session. All right, let's start off with a roll call. Commissioner Smith? I'm here, present, counted for. Com- Commissioner Kosalik? Kosalik, oh, still absent. And in his stead is, again, we are so, so happy, the mustache miracle worker, Mr. Mark Fenton. Mr. Mark Fenton, thanks for joining us. Privileged to be with you guys and sitting in Don's chair. All right. Okay, today's agenda discussion item. We'll get that going in a minute. Our whiskey pairing, the interview in our lightning round. Commissioners, can I get a motion to approve today's agenda? So moved. Perfect. To our listeners, just a reminder, you can find all our past meetings on our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. Go to YouTube, go to Amazon, go to Apple, Spotify, and Deezer, whatever you want. Uh, like, subscribe. We'd love it. And give us your feedback. If you want to email us, go for it. The Planning Commission podcast at Gmail. Other ways, like I said, Carrier Pigeon, I think is still going. I got one coming in right now with a message. Um, but we love your feedback. So give it to us and we uh, will take it and run with it and maybe even create an episode around it. Okay, so discussion item. This is a deep one, man. This is a this is a big one. I mean, this is also why we got uh, Mr. Fenton on our episode today because of this very this subject. It's a it's a big one. It's pretty much his bread and butter, right? So, my question to my fellow commissioners: It's a deep one. Get deep. I need you to find your inner depth here. All that experience that you've had. What does walking to you? What does walking mean to you as a planner? Holy cow! That's a big, broad, open ended question. What does walking mean to you as a planner? I'll give you a second to think about that. Uh, for me, man, it's huge, right? I mean, we do walkability trainings all over the, the country. And I'm amazed at when we do our trainings, how, how people react because they're like, I had no idea there's so much to it. I had no idea that it's not just put a sidewalk out there and call it good. Like, no, you got to cross the street, right? Yeah, that's important. How about at night? Oh, that's critical. Walking is such a fundamental piece. It's our it's our most basic way of movement, right? But yet it still is termed, it's still alternative transportation, according to some mm-hmm. anyway. What the heck are we thinking with that? <laughs> alternative pretty sure that's that's the first thing we celebrate in life is our first steps right we don't celebrate driving mom's station wagon for you know when we're 16 to 17 it's our first steps that were the most memorable thing so why is it not more important for us as a planner i don't know all right fellow commissioners thoughts what does it mean to you you know i i was just thinking as you were describing how it's the it's the first i was a really early walker I was, um, of course you were, you're gifted. I that was, way. I was an early walker. I came right out of the womb. You're just like strutting, huh? You're right like, you. what? Came out <laughs> screaming my lungs out. This is a true story. Screaming for two hours straight. They didn't know what was wrong with me. My mother heard that scream a couple of years later. I was angry. Um, oh, so just well. disturbing the peace here, but the thing about walking, I walked early, I talked early and I, and I read early and, and I don't know what that means because, as I've said before on this podcast, I don't know about childhood (laughs) development, but somebody told me I was special. So my special snowflake millennial self says that um, (laughs) that's what I did. But you know what I think about as a walking is that I'm so grateful that I can walk. I've had times in my life where um, Mm. I've had I've had trouble walking because um, I couldn't breathe well. I've, I've had some weird things going on in the last few years where my, my breath has been, um, compromised and I've been a singer my whole life. And, uh, I've always been a good breather, right? Cause you have to breathe well to be able to sing. And so walking and running 
the way you breathe when you walk and you run is very much the way that you control your breath when you sing. And so um, I just, I'm so grateful that I can walk. There, there have just been times that um, I've, I've never been so immobilized that I couldn't walk. Well, no, that's not right. I've, I have tore my Achilles tendon before and I could not walk with both feet. And I had to have one of those cool little bicycle things, but you never really <laughs> think about how much you need your legs until you can't use one of them, you know? So yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. so thankful I can walk. And I know that uh, when we talk about walking and mobility and, and all of that stuff, sometimes walking is, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not possible for some folks. Right. And so yeah, yeah. devices or whatever, but it's just something that's so um, crucial and I'm, I'm really thankful. And I'm That's a great way of putting that. Put and, that uh, <laughs> you know, before we get, get Mark's thoughts on this, I mean, that's where Don is right now. He's missing out on this podcast because he's developing a, an ADA transition plan for the mm -hmm. Chelan County, Washington. And mm -hmm. it's something that we do a lot of is ADA work. And it, that's well put because it's a great, you're, you're absolutely right. And there's also a frustration in that. I wish there was a global term <laughs> that does describe this motion of mobility minus a bicycle, minus transit, minus cars. Cause it's not walking. You're right. It's it, but that's kind of the general term that we apply. Yeah. And I know, you know, walking and rolling is is kind of a substitute for that but you know well put and and yeah we're we're very fortunate to to have that ability in the first place so i mean i'm Mark. looking forward to hover craft situation so <laughs> i mean you know we can never we're never going to be able to label this quite right so let's just forget yeah, about the label but yeah. the yeah, hovercraft the rolling the walking but segways had a shot but I know Mark's got some cool walking. It's gonna be. I, have a, I This better be good. Got you got feeling. like 40, 40 years of walking yeah. profession so, here. Okay, I mean. I'm gonna go macro. I, I actually <laughs> I think it. about this a lot, and I really think individual personal mobility, whether we call it walking or rolling or however we navigate, but moving through space just under your own power as yourself, really in particular, moving through space alone. I think it's the fundamental thread of the social fabric. So, mm. in as much as humans can get oh, together yeah. in society and create civil society and come to the social agreement that Rousseau wrote about. And, you know, I mean, that, that, that they can build places where we can live together happily and thrive, right? And that people of different backgrounds and across the spectrum of age and income and race have historically, when we do well, have been able to live together. It's yeah. because we're moving around in space as individuals and, inter and the interaction that that creates. I love it. And when we I take it, it away, I think we're starting to undermine the social fabric. I think that's how important walking is. And I feel you know, on the personal scale, it's the personal experience that Jess was just talking about. Yeah. And I feel it on the macro scale of building community. I, yeah. I, and what your point, man, you know, something that I, I crack up is I hear people when they go on a vacation somewhere and they're, oh, it's great. We've yeah. walked everywhere. Uh, you know, we saw the sights. We were never in a car. It was amazing. And then they come home. Can we put a crosswalk in here? No, it's going to delay us. <laughs> you know, like, what, <laughs> what, what just happened? You know, I mean, we were just in Las Vegas last weekend and my daughters, you know, who are nine and, and six, I mean, there we we're I think we got up to about seven miles one day and and their little legs are you know a foot long and they were exhausted it was awesome they were so tired and knocked out but you know yeah to your point like why can't we do more of that especially when we seemingly enjoy it in mm -hmm. other locations right I don't know but. Nice. Yeah. all right whiskey pairing now this, I told you, this one was a challenge mm -hmm. because I know a lot of people will think, think, well, it's America walks, John, you know, Johnny walk, you can't go Johnny Walker. Why, why can't we go Johnny Walker? Cause you tell he, me. Well, first of all, we already did Johnny Walker. I don't, we? did we, I don't think we did. <laughs> I'm but, pretty sure we did, but also it, Johnny Walker's not American, is it? There you go. Is Johnny it, Walker's not American. It's Scotch. That's why I don't drink it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But listen, li you know what? That's wrong. Last night I had a little Johnny Walker and it was delicious because that's what you need sometimes. Okay. Well, they're good for you. Scotch. I appreciate that. <laughs> so I had to think about this because otherwise it's not like it's an easy thing. So here's where I'm going to go. Ready? I'm going to go with old overhaul. You know why? Wow. This is the oldest consistent whiskey in America. 
This is the I first whiskey that. ever. Really? I do my homework. I can't How just you know arbitrarily pick something out of the sky. Oh, so originally well, made in <laughs> originally made in Pennsylvania. Huh. Now it's actually made in Kentucky uh, under Jim Beam, which is also one of the oldest sure. distillers out there. But America's oldest original, right? Mm-hmm. Whiskey. I thought, you know what? We're talking America walks. Walking is the original way of getting around. I know, mind blown, right? But I figured this would make a lot of sense and celebrate our own country and a foundational way of of us getting around. So that's what I got. Pretty good stuff. Not a very old um, age statement, but not everything has to be 20 years old and sat sitting around and you know collecting dust. Sometimes newer stuff can be very good as well. So anyway, all right. So with that, let's bring in our wonderful guest. Man, we got a good one. This is a good one. Are you ready? Our executive director of America Walks, Mike McGinn, former mayor of Seattle. Holy cow. Um, Mike, thank you so much for joining the Planning Commission podcast. I like your choice of whiskey. I, I think a straight rye whiskey from a, from the U.S. is a good choice. All so, right. Well, that's been, it's been endorsed. blessed. <laughs> awesome. We got the right guy for today. There we go. Right. All right. Well, Mike, if you would just start off, give us some basics about you. I know you have an extensive background, but hit some of the high spots and, and tell us how that career has led you to this current position and what you're doing with America Walks. Yeah, I could go on for a long time on this answer, so I'll try to keep it tight. Um, you know, originally from New York, big Irish Catholic family. And uh, after college, I managed to go work for a congressman from Oregon. Um, a classmate of mine from college was there and got an internship. One thing led to another, and it really opened my eyes up to how decisions were made and and how politics worked. I had a front row seat, and that got me out to Oregon, too, and then, you know, ultimately to the University of Washington Law School, and mm-hmm. as a lawyer, I was in private practice, but I was volunteering in the Sierra Club, volunteering in my neighborhood, and in the Sierra Club, we were working on big issues, you know, wilderness and sprawl and pollution. And then in my neighborhood, it, I moved to a part of Seattle that didn't have sidewalks. It was past the old city line. And mm. I had little kids. I couldn't walk to the, to the grocery store two blocks away without feeling very mm. unsafe because those wide roads, the cut through traffic moved really fast. It's like, what does it take to get sidewalks around here? And uh well, it turned out quite a bit, you know, <laughs> we don't have money for sidewalks. We don't even have money ah. to take care of our arterials, we were told. We, we don't have money to take care of basic infrastructure. We can't just be building sidewalks. So I did a lot of organizing and we did build some sidewalks in my neighborhood, um, but it led me to be head of my local community council and I started getting involved in land use issues. And mm-hmm. now my Sierra Club work was at the state chapter was getting really local. Uh, I started a nonprofit in Seattle around urban sustainability. You know, mm. we talked about active transportation and zoning and and housing issues and and green building. And one thing led to another. I uh, was trying to figure out who was going to be the next mayor. <laughs> we needed a better mayor, and there was going to be a close election coming up. And and I was looking for someone that had my values who I thought could win and nobody was going to run because everybody thought the incumbent had all the dollars and endorsements locked mm. up. And, um, so I got, I got in the race. Turned out I had the values I liked. So uh, I got in the race and I won. Congratulations. So, you yeah. have your own values. <laughs> right. right? I, yeah. So, uh, so I won the race and that was really great. And uh, we really worked on a lot of great stuff. Um, lost a close race for reelection. By the way, this is a warning to anyone out there working to get sidewalks in your neighborhood. You know, you don't know where it might lead. Um, we, got involved <laughs> yeah. in, we got involved in transportation ballot measures. I got involved mm-hmm. in all sorts of issues before mayor, during mayor, and actually post mayor. And, uh, you know, after the mayor, I, I started just returning to working with other advocates on, on walkability and active transportation and particularly its impact on climate. Climate was always a big motivator for me. You really can't get from here to there in terms of reduction in emissions without tackling um, without tackling that. And th- that was actually something that before I ran for mayor, I was very involved in Seattle's first climate action plan. And you know, Seattle had water power, had hydropower. 
So at the time, 40% of its emissions were from transportation, biggest source. And yeah. that's now becoming true for the U.S. as a whole, as we retire coal plants and replace it with mm -hmm. renewables. Um, transportation is now the leading source of emissions in the entire country. And you can't really solve that without getting at, um, it's not just going to be electric cars. You really have yeah. to get at the places people live. You have to put things close enough to each other to walk to them or bike to them or to adequately serve transit. You have to rededicate right of way to walking, biking, and transit. You got to build healthy, walkable places where people are free to move however they move. And you just can't, you know, and, and climate isn't something that you can do half a job on. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> you have to, you know, this isn't, so many of these things people are like, well, what's the low hanging fruit? Well, we got to pick the whole darn tree. The whole basket, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, we got to do the whole tree. And that means you can't make a plan to only pick the bottom half of the tree. You got to, and so, so you got to set somebody to work building the ladder to get to the top, right? Or getting the ladder right. to get to the top. And that's the land use and transportation piece. So we need to work this piece now in order to get to the finish line on this and uh, still motivated by that. And uh, one thing led to another, this America Walks job came up, I applied. <laughs> Turns out they they thought I'd do a, a, a good job at it, and I'm really grateful. It's a real gift to be able to bring these experiences to a national organization and a national platform like this. Like that's so cool. I I love hearing stories of folks who are um you know that they, they're not trained planners or engineers or whatever. They just care about their community, and they just because it's not it's not that hard. Just walk out your door and be like what how would I like to make this place better? Or what do I love about this place and I'd like to see more? So this is just such a fun story. And so I do want to hear more about America Walks though. Sure. So why was it created? Um, what is it? Uh, what, sure. what, how can you get involved? It was created 25 plus years ago. And there were, you know, there were places that had walkability organizations as opposed to biking organizations. And, mm -hmm. and I, I can't tell the story perfectly, but there was a group of leaders of these organizations who were at some national event where they were going to, people were trying to put together a national organization and they sequestered themselves in a hotel room one night and said, we're going to make sure that we have a walking organization and not get assumed into other people's advocacy. <laughs> and uh, they're known as the, they're known as the founding mothers. They were all women. Yep. That's and, awesome. uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a cool story. And I've chatted with half of them now, and uh, at least, and some of them, many of them are still active in the in the walkability movement. Um, I think the organizations continue to evolve and grown. They really focused not on walking as a mode choice. They focused on walkability as an outcome. And um, that that's always been part of America Walks because so many of the land use and transportation decisions are made at a local level, its mission has always been to support local advocacy and amplify the voices of local advocates at a national level. And we still do that. Um, we, uh, we, we train people to be advocates through our, our National Walking College. We have a great partnership with AARP. We have state uh, walking colleges and AARP has a fabulous livable communities initiative. They do. They they're really they're well funded. They're they got state offices, and they are fully committed to allowing uh, people to age in place, which means, you know, walkable communities and uh, with services nearby. Um, we we have been getting more deeply. We do webinars. We invite people to join our webinars. And since I've joined, we are focusing more not just on programs, but on campaigns around issues mm -hmm. in long term. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one, of course, is just uh, funding, making sure that all this new infrastructure, all this new infrastructure money is spent on good stuff, not bad stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. A hell of a lot's being spent on bad stuff, but there's new pops of money and new new amounts of money for yeah. for doing the right stuff. So. Let's try to get it, and particularly to the communities that need it the most, that deserve it the most, the under-resourced communities where walkability and and you know is is at its worst and pollution is at its highest. Mm -hmm. um, we we have become a host of the Freeway Fighters Network, mm. which are 
are the oh. advocates around the country who are working to remove highways from their communities and reconnect communities. Uh, they're also fighting highway expansion or working to mitigate the impacts of it. So right. it's been a high profile issue and it's great to be in it. And I, I, as mayor of Seattle, before I was mayor and as mayor, I tried to stop the reconstruction of a highway on Seattle's waterfront, uh, didn't mm -hmm. succeed, but that was one of a big issue for me as well on the Alaska Way Viaduct Replacement Project. Um, we have been supportive of people working to uh, decriminalize jaywalking. Mm -hmm. It is, in fact, the original uh, right of way. They call it the right of way, the right to yeah. be in the in the in the street public is, way that's right it's right in the name it's it right is. in the name you right? have the right to be in this public way and yes now we're you have to... the right to move about your community and you Classic. know we we know the history of jaywalking was to push people to the side and to criminalize the activity of simply going around your community and it's of course used pretextually way too often no matter anywhere they've collected the data, it's always young black men that are being stopped. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, see, and there's no and equity at all in how we do that. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, if you're a, yeah, it's, 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 and so just the very principle, though, is that people should be allowed to move through their community. And so we've been work, and that's been happening. Uh, multiple states around the country have decriminalized jaywalking and more are looking at it. Sounds um, to me like you're trying to re knit the social fabric, my friend. Yes. To just a moment oh. ago. That's yes. Listen, yes. Man, Reconnect I, communities, allow people that. to move about their communities, invest in walkability yes. everywhere. It really is, you know, I your point is really well taken. Like, like I, I chatted with everybody when I joined the staff of America Walks. Like, what is our mission? You know, what is we really about? And I think we landed, I know where I landed, and I think everybody was there too. It's it's really about the dignity of people in their own communities mm -hmm. is exactly what walkability is about. Said. Yeah. And Great. so what touches that is what we work on. Um, we also have a campaign where we are working to try to get safer vehicles. As we all know how vehicles yeah. have got bigger and more dangerous, worse visibility. How can we, uh, inf and there's a federal role there that we're pushing, um, but we're also pushing on, on state and local governments. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me give you an example on this, um, and I'd encourage if anyone uh, ha has any influence on this topic, we could wait and we'll push and it'll take a while. One day we will get feder better federal motor vehicle safety standards, but nothing prevents a state or local government, you know, from purchasing vehicles that are safer. Mm -hmm. And in particular, mm -hmm. adopting something called intelligent speed assistance. You got GPS, you got the mechanic, it's over the counter, you can retrofit your vehicle, and it will make your vehicle go the speed limit. And there's absolutely no reason in the world that a city vehicle should violate the speed limit set by city officials going about its daily business. Mm -hmm. Saves fuel, will save lives. Um, and is Lower just greenhouse gas emissions, yeah. right? All sorts of great things come out of Reduces that. Reduces climate emissions, right? So you got vision zero, you got climate reductions, you have uh, fuel one. savings, it pays for itself. So um, All right. you're setting up though, you're setting up a question here that I, I want to put to you, Mike, if I could, yeah, because um, bigger vehicles are one of the reasons I hear people say, you know, that it's dangerous out there. When we say, why aren't people walking? You know, and you know, we've right. done, we, we've worked together with the Centers for Disease Control that's very concerned about how sedentary Americans are, that we don't walk our kids to school. We don't ride bikes. We don't, you know, we're not physically active as part of transportation. We're walking less, it would appear. Um, right. What do you think about the environment? You know, what is changing? And I think vehicle risk is one of those, but I think there are a lot of others you've already alluded to. Um, and what are we seeing in the places that are being successful? So characterize sort of right. why have we been walking less and what seems to be the stuff that's showing promise in getting people back out and moving under their own power? Well, you know, there's a lot of data out here and I'm probably not the best person to talk about the data, but it's it's really clear that, you know, a street grid with lots of local destinations is one of your best predictors of walkability. You bet. So when you live in a place with, great destinations nearby, you're more likely to walk. And that's probably the biggest factor is, is that we have, 
you know, gone all in as a country on a suburban land use pattern for many decades now. And we really need to, to think about, and, you know, with single use districts, right? The offices are here, the retail is here, and the housing is here. And then we even carve up the housing into districts. The apartments are here and the single family homes are here. Right. And the single family homes for 250,000 are here and the 450s are there and the 650s are yeah. there. Mm -hmm. We even segregate by income when we do that, don't we? Yeah, we certainly do. And, and your classic, you know, e this is even a town, a town that I grew up in on Long Island, you know, within blocks of each other, you know, at the top of my block was an apartment building. Well, I grew up in a single family home, but there was a garden apartment one block mm -hmm. over. There was an apartment building at the top of the block. There were maybe some residences above the uh, above the homes, above the businesses. Excuse me, on the seven minute walk to the train station that went to. So the wait, wait, city. God forbid, Mike. Did that mean that you, as a kid, were interacting with kids from different income levels and maybe uh, even wait for it, different races? Is that possible, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> well, cow, it was I Long Island, so it was Raise Long it, Island. Dog. So the different races was that was pretty segregated too. Yeah, I hate to say Island. it. Yeah. Right. And a lot yeah. of places were, but certainly different income levels and and um, changed in high school for me for for then interacting with people from from broader, you know, different races. But but yeah, it was we've separated all that. And so you got to drive from place to place. So that's the first one. So when people talk about we got to put a sidewalk everywhere. Yes. Yes. You should be able to walk down a road and be safe. But really, you have to put things close enough to each other is is the is the most important thing. And then you have to design the streets where the cars aren't screaming by you at 35 or 40 miles an hour or 50 mm -hmm. or 60. Right. You yeah. got to get to me like you're saying down. there's a role for planners to play here. Huh? Talk about <laughs> land use planning, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes. It's weird. It's weird. Yes. We talk about land use planners and then transportation planners. And I have to stop everybody. I'm like, listen. You yep. can call me a transportation planner if you want to, but transportation uses land. I mean, except for the ones that go through the air, but they still start on the ground. So I've, we're all land use planners. We can't forget about the land use just because you're a specialist in a particular area. So for all you budding transportation planners out there, remember you are using land. It's very important. I think we just get off the hook because a lot of times it's public land, right? It's very specific areas that we work in for it. Anyway, that's that's my string. Well, no, I, <laughs> I almost want to get in here on this planning thing, man. Like this is like that topic. I know you want to go to some other places, but no, but, let's talk about it. We love talking about too, planning. But, <laughs> but all of this bad stuff that we see, we planned, right? Yeah. It's part of a plan. Like yeah. we planned to separate everything because we thought it was a good idea. We planned the interstates because we thought it was a good idea. We planned overly wide, fast streets without sidewalks and crossings because we thought it was a good idea. Sure did. So like, and, and honestly, like some of the best neighborhoods you see, like my neighborhood in Greenwood in Seattle, mm. was all built before there was a plan. Okay. Like people yeah. just built places. They naturally put things near each other because that's how you got around. And you built it around the streetcar stop because that's where you got off the at the end of the day when you were heading home. So, like yeah. some like like somehow or another we've lost capacity and in, in our own innate understanding of how to organize our spaces around ourselves for comfort and pleasure and quality of life. Like we and now we've done it so long the wrong way that when you go to change it, everybody yells at, you know, yeah. not everybody, but yeah. a lot of people start to yell, well, you can't change that. Make it hard for me to drive or, you know, you you know, we need that. We need it that way. You, you can't narrow the street or you can't, uh, yeah. you can't bring in the apartment building. Like somehow or other, we've gotten used to this really unpleasant state of affairs and defended and forgot like pain. our own ability to make things. <laughs> Yeah, we are. A, we are a masochistic, masochistic <laughs> culture, aren't we? Um, a couple of points on that. Yeah, you know, you brought up. <clears throat> so, man, I tell you, one of the one of the benefits of doing this podcast that I had no idea was going to even be something that came about was it's amazing how connected we can be and easy we can be to reach one another now. And you mentioned something a minute ago about people who are working to to tear down some of the very div divisive highways in our communities. And 
not a month ago, I'm sitting here watching PBS and there's a woman out of New Orleans named Amy Stelly, who's been that voice in that community. Very next day, found her on the internet, talked to her on the phone, said, hey, you want to be on? She said, absolutely. She's going to be on in about three weeks. And I'm like, yes, it's so wonderful. And I'm so happy that, you know, yeah, there's people out there who are who are really trying and in some cases successful in that endeavor. Um, and I'd be remiss. I just something else that you noted as just working in a city recently who's got some problems with it when it comes to pedestrian and, and bicyclist crashes in particular, you know, streets that are very hostile, you know, as you'd imagine. And you get to talking to them and doing a little bit of digging and you go talk to the land use planning department and go, you know, how, how involved are you in the transportation decisions? Oh, not at all. Wait, wait, what do you mean? Not at all. <laughs> they are literally completely and utterly detached yet the transportation department who is all engineers pretty much just dictates all of their outcomes on the land use side. I'm going, well, here's a fundamental issue, right? <laughs> like this isn't going to work. Um, so yeah, to your point, we have to be hand in glove to make these things work, no doubt. Well, it's, and it, it was, it, I think this is a really challenging piece, but so much of the transportation engineering profession, as we know, has been about the the, the metrics they use are literally how many cars yeah. Yeah. can they move through a space at a time. And, you know, one of the things I did as mayor was work on um, Seattle DOT making places part of, you know, treating streets as places as being one of their priority objectives in their plan. And, you know, some of that occurs. We had a great uh, traffic engineer, get him on, Dong Ho Chang. He's now mm. the watchdog engineer. Yeah, he's so, great. So you see that, you see that change in the profession occurring, like NACTA, which is a great partner, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, you know, which for your listeners, it was formed in response to the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, ASHTO, right? So you, you've you got the, the, the professions changing, but it really needs to change a lot more. And the metrics should not, the metrics, I guess what I'm getting at with that talk about places, the metrics yeah. aren't even about the number of people conveyed through a space. Right. Like, yeah. Let's even get rid of cars for a sec. Let's just say the metric isn't just the number of people conveyed through a place. It is how does the place work for the people there as well? Right. We can't we just look at numbers and percentages and things because what you do for a community of 2000 that's very rural is very different than what you do for a place like L.A. There's there's just it's just a very different landscape and we can't, uh, you know, I, the, one of the frustrations, and we, we've talked about this before, um, is, is cookie cutter plans, right? We have to do this plan because it's what is required by the states, required by the federal, you know, the federal code of regulations, whatever it is. And um, we, we have got to be better, I think, as planners and engineers and, and city designers, we have to be better in making decisions that are what's right for our community. And, and, that, and that takes a lot of work and a lot of arranging and a lot of information and a lot of people taking responsibility for where they live. So I'm thinking about when it comes to walking and, yeah. and in our communities, uh, where do you think, Mike, that you've seen progress over your 25, yeah. 30 years? And yeah. where do you think you were, um, were missing the mark? Yeah. You know, and I'm gonna make one more observation about what you about what you were just commenting about, which was mm -hmm. look at the equity issues there in how we think about streets. Like, what is the yeah. ideal street if you're well off? It's a cul-de-sac, right? It's literally not designed for moving people at all, except to the front door. And what are the streets? Where do we put the streets that move the most people? We put them through poor neighborhoods, right? So people have to breathe the air pollution. In fact. We know that the air pollution effects of living next to a busy road can outweigh the health effects of living in a walkable place. So there's really deep equity issues here about sure. when we view a road being for movement and when we view it for being a place. Well, um, I, I think you should go down that rabbit hole a little bit more because it's it interesting what you were saying. You said, you know, the affluent area, areas um, that you want a cul-de-sac. Oh, you know, and and big mobility goes through maybe a a, a a more impoverished neighborhood. 
what's really interesting is um, I think 10 years ago, we could have said that resounding, yes, that's the way that it looks right now. Today, the higher income households, the, the desirable places are those walkable places. People are going back Absolutely. to those, Absolutely. yeah, where you can walk to your services, where you can go get your, I mean, I there some of the most expensive real estate in cities right now are those really cool neighborhoods where you can go have lunch and get your hair done and walk to work. I mean, that's where folks are going now. So it's it's really interesting how we're shifting what's bougie, right? Um, I, I, yeah, no, absolutely, amazing. absolutely, and I think that goes to your, your, you know, you're going right to your question, which is what's changed. And I, I yeah. think that's, I think that if you look generationally as well, mm -hmm. um, exactly, mm -hmm. there's just unquestionably um, the demand to live in walkable places yes. is, has gone up, and it's really marked from a generational perspective as well. Which is nope. funny because if you think about the the generational change of these walkable places, it's multi generational, right? We yeah. it's it's multiple generations. It's not just you know your college kid who can't you know is, who's who's doesn't want to spend the money on a car you know and wants to live in a place where they can kind of get around on their bike or something. Now it's um you know my my folks and 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 my and my siblings and 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 little kids and stuff. They're just they don't want to get licenses. I was reading an article the other day. Day. so few um you know it, the drop in 16 and 17 year olds having a driver's license amazing. it's it's, a, it's incredible i remember i could not wait to get my driver's license that was freedom that was freedom i bought my first car for $3500 in dollar in 100 dollar bill i remember it was cash i think my <laughs> actually i think my dad did it <laughs> and, and i just remember him peeling those off it was so and i was like this is the coolest thing and um and i felt free you know and 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 if if now if you I have to own a car right now because I live in Alaska. But right. if, if I could live in a place where I didn't need own a car, oh my gosh, that would be so much. I, I just find it, it is, wildly inconvenient. <laughs> it, is liber, it is liberating to live in a place where you don't need a car. It is tremendously liberating. Well, talking about those changes, I would say one of the biggest changes is when I formed, you know, I so I'd, I'd been involved in the climate work in Seattle and I and and the, the light bulb had gone off that transportation and land use was key to climate. And so I started, you know, kind of when I started my nonprofit, it was really to focus on trying to demonstrate that there was public demand for changes in land use and transportation. Because of course there were, you know, the architects and the green builders and, and some of the development community that was moving away from greenfield development to, to infill mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. So they were there. But where was the public that was there at that point? And but what I was finding was that there were people in neighborhoods around Seattle that were like me, that were like, hey, an apartment building here would be pretty good. A bike lane yeah. here would be pretty good. Right. Like like they wanted those things. Well, I felt like I was, you know, trying to create something then trying to demonstrate that there was this public demand for, you know, sustainable urban design and walkability, et cetera. Now it's a movement. It's mm. a genuine movement, right? Like there are people, there are many, many more organizations. There are many more people talking about it. You mm. go to TikTok and, you know, <laughs> seriously, man. I like love TikTok. Educating, <laughs> the, the young people are motivated. They're educating each other on the elements of walkability, effective transit, you know, what makes a good place. Um, and, you know, the demand for housing you know, I think that, you know, older people, you know, they're like, oh, you know, that, you know, the old, not all the older generations, I'm older, you know, and Mark looks a little it's older. Okay. <laughs> you two look really young. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, it used to be, oh, we can't have that apartment building because what do we do with all the cars? But young, the younger generation is going, where's my place to live? Yeah. Like I was promised yeah, yeah. that if I, I did the right thing, transit. I'd have a place to live. Where's my house? And where's my nearest transit stop to that? And place? where's my nearest where transit gonna... stop? And, park. And I don't want to know where my know, park, where I'm going to park the car. I want to know where the bike share is, where the yeah. transit yeah. stop, right? Yeah. And where's, where's the, the movie joint? Where the nearby store and coffee the shop and blue pub are? And I need I and I need fast internet. I need internet so fast. You know, yeah. I mean, it's no longer one of these things like internet's real great here. No, 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 no. It must be fast. You know, so it's all yeah. of these connectivity things 
that we're pushing towards. And you know, I think back about these last few years, um, and Mark, tell me, tell me what you think about this too. I, as we're kind of walking through this next uh, set of questions, it's like the last few years have felt so isolated and rough yeah. and things have shifted. It's been this huge stress on the world. Real and slice I, in the social fabric, right? Because we I aren't know. interacting. We're not out I on know. the street next to each other. And it, right? and it wasn't because, yeah, awesome. it wasn't because we chose not to at nope. this point. It was like, you absolutely cannot. This is not mm-hmm. going to happen right now. And and I think it 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 robbed our souls of that joy of being with others, right? And even as little as something like walking out your door and seeing your your mailman, right? That's mm. that or, or your mail person. And and it was just it was it it still feels so heavy on my heart that that has shifted our world. And I think there is a desire to live differently. And I I find myself thinking about that a lot. Well, I, I want to grab on some, Mike, you said lots, there's a movement now, lots of entities are involved and some are surprising, like the National Association of Realtors, right? They're the guys who sell homes, yeah. recognize the, the men and women who sell homes, recognize mm-hmm. this. And they have a whole smart growth movement about oh, yeah. this. They have a, a, a publication a couple times a year called On Common Ground that talks about how this is now desirable. So uh, we're not sort of wackadoodles out on the perimeter anymore talking about things like living in a community where you can walk to your daily and, destinations. And we can get anchored in the politics of the past, right? Yeah, like yeah. politicians, you know, when I was active before I ran for mayor, it was widely believed that talking about single family zoning was a third rail of politics. Yeah, don't touch it. Don't, don't touch, touch it. it. Okay. Now, <laughs> what the polling shows, what the polling shows is, you know, like the recent poll in Washington state, um, Polling shows that people want to see infill housing and missing middle housing, including getting rid of single family zoning and the support remains strong, even if it's in their own neighborhood. Mm, which I, is big. Like These are really dramatic changes. So yep. and, and you start to see state governments now weighing in. Now you have to allow backyard cottages. Oh, you have to get rid of parking minimums. Right. You have to you have to allow apartment buildings. You and we'll allow you, duplexes and quads by by right. 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 So listen, man, this speaks to I, I, look at think about your trajectory. You start as a local guy thinking about a sidewalk on a street and then you're with an advocacy organization, still local level Sierra, and then it gets grows. And, and then you move to the, you know, that big city, you're, you run for mayor. And then you're now you're up at the national level. I'm curious, is your trajectory, are you running for sort of a planetary uh, walkability czar? <laughs> is that your next, step? is that, because that seems to me the trajectory, your line, you know, local up to national. Okay. To, to, you know, and, and, and how, where's that, how, what's the evolution of the work you're doing because of that, quite honestly, man? Well, first of all, I'm definitely Earth first. You know, like yeah. Mars, okay. Mars is a I'll, I'll be your campaign second. manager for national <laughs> for, for planetary walkability czar. I'm in there. Well, you know, it, it actually is is really kind of a lesson to us, right? Like we yeah. have one planet, and it's really a pretty awesome place if we treat it right. Like we've been here a long time. It works great when we're when we're gentle with it and and live in in harmony with it. So let's do more of that. For me, like just on a on a on a purely personal level, the national I the the idea that I now that that the America Walks Board hired me and has given me this national platform where I can try to use, you know, the things I've learned over the decades to help other local advocates. I'm really grateful for that. And you know, for if you're out there and you want to get engaged, you know, go check out our website and uh, see if there's a local organization already near you that you can join. Um, if you want to get involved in your, you know, look at our resources, do a walk audit in your neighborhood, you know, get people out and see, see, see what's different, you know, contact us if you're interested in trying to figure out how to get engaged, you know, attend our webinars, you know, apply for our trainings. We would love, love to help you do that. Um, like I said, I'm extraordinarily grateful to be here. I'll be honest, though, I miss the day to day of the local advocacy, man, like, mm-hmm. like, bring me back. Bring me back to the fight. And of course, uh, when I was doing in the mayor's office, you know, the beauty of the mayor's office was that uh, um, I got to work on so many different issues, right? And we had a big team and we had a staff and you had the whole city staff that you could try to, you know, reorient them towards these things. It's hard. Mayors come and go and staff sticks yeah. around and it's hard work to move move agencies uh, in new directions. But we did to a great degree. Yeah. 
And, you know, the other really great thing about that experience was that as a mayor, you're invited into every community. You're asked to participate in the community rituals and, and to share their joys and their grief, you know, and yeah. their challenges and to try to address it. And for me, that was an evolution, like just getting involved in my community and trying to get sidewalks meant I had to get out of my own house and connect with other people. Yeah trying to make things happen at a city level meant I had to connect with people from other neighborhoods and work with them. And, you know, that was a base that I, people came to help me when I ran for mayor that I had no idea they would because I'd worked with them. And it, it, it was so rewarding and it changed me. I became so much more understanding and empathetic and uh, passionate about issues around racial and social equity. When you see who is left out, right? When you see what neighbor what neighborhoods complain about, and you know, and what neighborhoods got real deep complaints that are legit, and and which and which neighborhoods are actually pretty well off, yeah. and you know, what are they upset about? And so all of that is just an amazing passage. So that so I recommend it to anybody. Hmm. I recommend it to anybody like. Like you may come for the work or you may come for this cause you want to create, but ultimately the act of being in community with others to try to change the place you're at, to make it work for everybody, you know, if you're lucky, it'll change you too in a better way. So I'm, I just feel really lucky, but I do miss that on, on the ground, hands-on advocacy, yeah, yeah. trying That's to hold elected officials accountable. You that's know, where you feel, right? Stir. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I love to do. So, yeah. so come, come, if you're out there and you want to do stuff, come, you know, come plot and plan with me, man. Give me some vicarious <laughs> thrills about, <laughs> about all the world changing you're doing in your community. I need to hear from you. Those are the roots of the organization, too. I was lucky enough to be a, a longtime member of Walk Boston, where Anne Hirschfang and Dorothea Hass were sort of two of those original mothers of the movement. And, and, um, and that's, you know, was a local advocacy organization upon which, you know, America Walks was built. And, and I wanted to just give them a nod because I know they were two of the, that, that handful that had that original vision. And boy, you know, you're absolutely right. Keeping your fingers dirty or your feet dirty as you're walking in it is good. <laughs> so Mike, we're going to make sure that we'll post, you know, the website and any other upcoming sure. information that you have um, coming up on, Amer on America Walks behalf. I know you all have your fingers in, in lots of different places and doing wonderful things, like you said, with trainings and webinars and, and the whole nine yards. So we'll certainly make sure that our listeners and viewers have access to that. But in the meantime, let's change gears a little bit. And we're going to go to the lightning round. I'm going to pepper you with okay. a whole bunch of nonsense stuff. I'm going to make this, I'll, I'll start off with a little easier one. So being that you were in Seattle, I'm going to make you commit to it. Favorite all-time Seattle singer or band, some sort of musical act. Oh, wow. Wow. No, <laughs> no. As a mayor, as even one. as a former mayor, no, <laughs> no. We love all of our... We love all of our artists and musicians. I know you do, but you got to choose you one. That's that the rules. If I had to pick one, oh which one God. accidentally puts goes on to your headphones as you're on a walk? How about that? Which one? Which one? Um, uh, okay, um, there there are so many great ones, but you know, there's there's one that I actually listen to a lot. Not very well known, Sarah Cahoon, beautiful singer. Oh, okay. Highly recommend okay. her. Highly recommend her. Um, as a, as a Seattle musician, I'll go with I'll go with her. Wow, that's a definite curveball. I'll have to look that one up. I don't know that I know her. Yeah. So Mike, so Mike, uh, Seattle's best or Starbucks? Oh, oh no, <laughs> another no, hard one. <laughs> no, okay. I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to cause any trouble here. <laughs> but, These but, are the really important topics. That no, we're no. This today. one is like <laughs> no. I'm, well, neither. Right. It's got to be local. You got to pick a locally owned. <gasps> there you go. On the gonna, street. Gonna be there neither. you go. But, but it is not forgotten among certain people in Seattle that the owner of Starbucks sold the Sonics to you know bandits from Oklahoma who took our <laughs> team. <laughs> <laughs> So no we can never, abandoned. we can never, yeah, no, that was, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you an Solidarity easy Solidarity with Sonic stands. I'm going to yeah. give you a non-controversial one. Favorite sure. hike in the Pacific Northwest. Where would be your, your best place to go for a hike? You know, 
it, this is, if, if you want to measure it by the place I've gone back to the most often, it's actually behind me right now on this setting. It's a, it's a place called Navajo Peak Trail, uh, mm. Stafford Creek Trail. And it's, uh, it's just, a, it's, it's not a terribly long hike in, but you can wander around these high mountain basins. And so I've done this several times. I've done it with my kids. You won't find it in the guidebooks as one of the best. Like there's so many awesome ones, but but in terms of accessibility, big, big payoff. Um, and particularly as I get a little older, I can't cover as many miles. Yeah, this one's pretty good. Uh, since you called me out for being old, when I come out and visit, you're taking me there too. <laughs> I will go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, okay. I'll tell you, last year I did Spider Gap. And uh, oh my God, absolutely spectacular. Spider Gap. They, they're going to they're gonna make, they're going to put permits on it soon because mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. So Get it, get it now. I haven't made it to the enchantments yet. That's still on my checklist for, for the, rest, the rest. I was going to ask you a, a kind of related question, but I'll change it a little bit. So what is your favorite small town getaway in the greater Puget Sound, Washington area? Oh, that's, that's a fabulous question too. Small town getaway in, in the Puget Sound area. A lot of good ones. We went quite often, um, at, with family, we went to uh, Port Townsend. There was oh, a place. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's an old army fort there called Fort Warden, which mm -hmm. uh, is now a state park that rents its houses. And so, uh, the, on, on officers' row, uh, an officer and a gentleman was filmed there. Yeah. So if yeah. you so you you could if you could and at the time it was cheap. I don't know how it is now. But we would go rent one of the old officers' quarters, which was on the old parade ground, and it's right next to Puget Sound, and or rather Admiralty Inlet and the Strait of Juan de Fuca and woods and everything. And Port Townsend is a yeah. town that was kind of bypassed, so it it retained a lot of its old architecture. So I was I was stationed up on Whidbey Island in Oak Harbor and yeah. got a chance to experience that 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 area and Coop little town of Coopville, which is one of my favorites. And Port Townsend, incidentally enough, home of the, the original godfather of walkability, Dan Burden himself, right? The one and so, only. Yeah, the first that's where mustache, he lives. Really, to, yeah. for, uh, we all emulate, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, good oh, spots. And it, and it kept its walkable roots. It kept yeah. its walkable roots, and at least in the core of the town. And they're still doing good stuff out mm -hmm. there. Perfect. Just or uh, Mike, I got one more for you. I don't remember what years were you mayor again? Two thousand and nine to two thousand thirteen. Okay, so, but you were in there, and I got. I always give grief to Jess because she always calls everything that has to do with sports sports ball for some reason. That's what but, it is. You want a label for something <laughs> that works? <laughs> but I do have to ask you. You were in the Seattle area. And maybe became a Mariners fan, but your roots are in New York, in in the uh, the borough area right there. So I've got to wonder that what was it, two thousand one when the when the Mariners won one hundred and twenty games or whatever, and we're playing the Yankees. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. who are you rooting for? Oh yeah, no, I totally switched to Seattle teams. Um, <laughs> okay, I totally switched to Seattle teams. That that happened. I was a Knicks fan growing up, so I grew oh, up. Yeah, yeah. I grew up watching Walt Frazier and yeah, uh, yeah. Earl Pearl Monroe and and yeah. Dave DeBusher and Willis Reed and Bill Bradley. So, yeah. So I grew up with that. But when I moved to Seattle, I actually did fall in love with the Sonics and, and became a Sonics fan um, and 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 enjoyed that, enjoyed following them tremendously. Yeah, that's a so, bummer that they had uh, that they that they moved for sure. They were stolen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, stolen as another way of putting it. You know. but a, as a Rams fan, I'm so sorry that you're a Sea Chickens fan, though. You know, that's a bummer. But sea in any chickens. case, they've had a good run. They've had a good run here. Yeah. 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 No, no doubt have about they? it. No have doubt. they? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I think we're going to call this episode a wrap. Mike McGann, Executive Director of America Walks. Thank you so much for spending, I know, your incredibly valuable time talking with us and a subject that we all care deeply for and all need to do more of i don't know fenton you get like 25 miles of walking a day i think you're probably good still trying to do it man. still going <laughs> well thank you mike yeah. for joining the planning commission podcast we appreciate it well thank you for having me and i really yeah. appreciate uh the work you the, the good work you all are doing out there to to promote the promote the cause so thank awesome. you awesome 
Great All right, to our audience, uh, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. Hit up YouTube, Amazon, Apple, all those. Please subscribe, like all those wonderful things and hit us up with a message once in a while. We really do appreciate that. Commissioner Fenton, thank you so much for stepping in and doing a fabulous job, just like we knew we that you would. Thank you. What a privilege <laughs> to be with you guys. This is so fun. Thank you. <laughs> You're Thanks a big believer here. in this podcast when we sat down and talked about it conceptually about a year ago. And I remember over a whiskey. Over, <laughs> over a whiskey. You were you had the vision and man in Utah, no get, less. <laughs> if you get Mike McGinn to come, you know it's the real deal. Well done, man. <laughs> Well, we're we trying. Did it. You doing well, thank you for your support. And to our listeners, thank you for your support. We appreciate it. Commissioners, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. I'll second that. All right. With that, this episode is in the can. Thank you for everything you're doing, listeners. And uh, we'll keep on keeping on and we'll see you soon. Hey, everybody. Commissioner Danley here. Would you like to see more? Hear more? Well, we got you covered. Go to our website, www theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. It's got everything you want. Guests, yep, past episodes, video, the audio, even our whiskey pairing, links to everything about all the people we've had on, books, websites, you name it. It's unbelievable. You want to reach out to us? Please, we'd be more than happy to chat. You can email us, planningcommissionpodcast at gmail.com. You want to tweet at us? Go for it, at planningcommission. We're also on YouTube with the Planning Commission podcast channel, Facebook. Heck, send us a carrier pigeon if you need to. We'd love to hear from you about ideas, guests, you name it. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. We'll keep doing our thing. You keep doing yours. Have a good one.